Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman. This video lecture is a brief history of training in clinical psychology. It is being developed primarily for history and systems of psychology classes. Let me start by giving a little bit of an introduction to my own connection with uh, different training models. I have uh, been teaching graduate school in psychology for nearly 20 years now and have taught in master's programs, uh, clinical psychology programs embedded with it in the PsyD degree program and PhD programs as well as counseling psychology uh, doctorate level programs. Within these programs have experienced a lot of different types of training models. The training models are, are very important in setting some of the foundational assumptions and approaches that a program is going to take to training and the values that is seen as most important in its graduates. The training models originated primarily looking at graduate education. However, they also are applied to practicum sites and in particular internship training in psychology. To be APA accredited either as a graduate program, as a degree program, or as an uh, internship site, there's a need to have a clearly articulated training program. The different training programs share some things in common, but there's also some important divergences in it. It's important as a student to be aware of your training model. This has implications for internship sites, for what you're going to experience, what's going to be expected of you in your program. If there's an accreditation visit while you're there, it's important for you to be familiar with it. So there's a lot of reasons to be important to be familiar with your training model. As a student, also as a faculty member or a supervisor or clinician at different training sites. As you move into different places into your career where you may be at training sites or universities, again, it's important to be familiar with the different types of training models and, and what the implications of these are. So this lecture will look take a historical approach of looking at how a few different models developed. We'll look at the two most popular training models in a little bit more depth, and then we'll talk about some of the, the implications to them. So we'll look at the training models from Boulder to Vail in the NCSBP and beyond, the PhD and PsyD model, and then again we'll talk about some of the implications and particularly unpack two of the models more uh, directly, including the scientist practitioner model. The scientist, scientist practitioner model of clinical training was established at the Boulder Conference in 1947. This was when psychology was still working to establish itself within the academy and an approach to, to training was necessary. It also was important in looking towards as, things such as licensure and standing in the field once you have your degree. So there's a number of reasons why it was important to look at developing training models uh, from a very practical standpoint. And the, the Boulder model had a number of things that were established as part of as, uh, pillars as the training. A basic knowledge of principles of psychology and research methods, and that research methods really becomes important in distinguishing it from other models later. The understanding of psychometrics, again connected to that research aspect there. Psychopathology, psychotherapy, conducting a dissertation with empirical research that must be new research. That's important also in distinguishing it from other models. And a one-year internship. This is thought of as the, the PhD model, although some PsyD prog programs may use it as well. Uh, it is, as I noted, one of the, the two most popular models as a, as a scientist practitioner model. Now, in the 1960s, between Boulder and Vail, there, there began concerns about uh, the PhD scientist practitioner model. The, the concerns included that students um, from a number of programs seem unprepared for the clinical practice of psychology, particularly therapy. Now this concern emerged because there was a lot of focus on the research aspect and so it was easy to neglect some of the clinical aspects. This concern will still be voiced at times today by some internship sites. Uh, some internship sites are, are leery of people from the scientist practitioner model because of that often they do not have as much experience and emphasis on training. This is not always the case though. Uh, there's a lot of variation within these, but that was an important concern. So the Boulder model, it was argued, was not meeting the needs of a lot of individuals wanting to be practitioners, and it was not meeting the needs for the number of practitioners that were needed. 
the mental health field needed more people that were, were practitioners and working with clients and the PhD model in part because it was slow and in part because of the research focus that mentioned there was concerns was not um, helping produce enough good clinicians to meet the needs of consumers. So the PsyD model, the PsyD degree was recommended in 1967 and the first university-based PsyD was established at the University of Illinois in 1968. Now the PsyD a degree is often more associated with professional schools of psychology. And the first professional school of psychology was established in 1970, which was the California School of Professional Psychology. Now that um, school is part of Alliant University. By 1972, there were four campuses for the California School of Professional Psychology across California. So this model was starting to grow pretty quickly but there was a lot of concerns about it and a lot of biases against the PsyD degree. Those have changed a bit over time, but there still are some of them around today. The Vail Conference was in 1973. It was an APA-sponsored conference uh, that was connected to the PsyD degree to establish training standards for this approach. The practitioner-scientist model, which was later adapted to the practitioner-scholar model, came out of this conference. Now both the uh, scientist practitioner model that we talked about and the practitioner scholar model here have evolved some since their initial beginning, but this did help to set the foundation for the practitioner scholar model, and the practitioner scholar model is the other of the two most popular models. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later on, but the focus was more on training clinicians to use research in clinical practice instead of training people to be researchers who then were clinicians second. So the research component focused more on being good consumers of research and able to apply research in a clinical context. And a lot of the advocates here, um, our advocates and practitioners need to be able to critically think about research, not necessarily to be experts in conducting research. And there is a difference there, though certainly learning how to do it will help you to be a good critical consumer as well. But the focus here was on that practitioner component. So as I mentioned, uh, since Vail, there's an increasing number of PsyD program, schools, and the PsyD programs tend to be larger and put out more graduates. So over time, there's been a, a change in the number of people with PsyD degrees versus PhD degrees that are psychologists. There's been increasing acceptance of PsyDs in many contexts, though it is uh, not across the board. Uh, PsyDs will often have more difficulty getting uh, jobs in research-based programs have more difficulty getting research-based uh, jobs as well. So the, the PhD degree does have a little bit more flexibility with it yet in the job market in to some context, but um, but there is has been a lot more acceptance of CIDs over time as well. This also connects with a, a gradual con, uh, transition from the majority of psychologists being in academic and research settings to a majority being clinicians. And you'll see this today that there are more people that are psychologists that are practitioners than uh, academics and researchers, although certainly some will fall into both categories as well. But that has had an impact on changing the field. Now, as this uh, new training model, new direction in psychology starts to, to gain momentum and continues to grow, there came the National Council of Schools and Programs of Professional Psychology, or NCSPP. Now, originally, its intent was to be an alternative to APA accreditation. This never really grew out in the way that was anticipated. Uh, it grew out of the Vail model under the leadership of Nicholas Cummings and had its first meeting in 1976. Um, currently, or recently, has served to represent the professional schools in PsyD degree to APA. However, over time, it's become much more closely related to APA. It advocates for the professional schools and their values, yet in a lot of ways, and has increasing representation on the APA Committee on Accreditation. And we can see um, as we'll talk about, some of the values that came out of the, the practitioner-scholar model have had a, a broader influence on the field of psychology, including some that uh, have influenced evidence-based practice and PhD approaches as well. 
in CSPP developed core competencies that originally there were um, six and then the seventh and eighth were added. I believe it was originally six and the seventh and eighth were added later. These are a relationship competency, an assessment competency, an intervention competency, a research and evaluation competency. Again, that's not necessarily conducting research, but it is consuming research. A consulting and education competency, a management and supervision competency, and then diversity and advocacy have been added over time as well. These were influential on the, uh, the second pillar of evidence-based practice in psychology, clinical expertise. And for most of you, if you are taking the history and systems class with me, we will talked about evidence-based practice most likely prior to this, otherwise it will be coming in the class, and, this, um, the, and how the evidence-based practice came about from the empirically supported treatments and distinguishing itself from the empirically supported treatments but also how it's changed over time. But in its original conception, these core competencies were very influential on the development of what is understood as the clinical expertise. It still remains influential in uh, APA's approach to accreditation of graduate programs. When we compare the PhD versus the PsyD, now I really want to emphasize that there are variations in PhD and PsyD programs. So these should not be generalized across the board. These are tendencies, trends, not absolutes. So the PhD tends to be more often university-based, have smaller programs. It's more focused on academic and research. There often are more funding and scholarship options in the PhD programs, though it depends a little bit on their location uh, and uh, what type of university or other system they are embedded in. We tend to be higher e triple p pass rates, which is the licensing exam for psychologists, more focus on research as compared to clinical skills, and faculty tend to be scholars and involved in research and grant writing. Now, when we compare this to the society model, they're more often in professional schools, though a number of them are university-based as well, college and university-based as well. The programs tend to be larger, have more students in them and less focus on research, particularly conducting research, though being good consumers of research is still emphasized. There tend to be fewer funding and scholarship opportunities. Um, it's more focused on clinical applications and training as opposed to being more focused on research in the PhD model. Um, it's more focused on clinical skills as opposed to research. And faculty are often involved in their field of study. Um, PhD programs, sometimes it's expected, uh, often is expected that faculty are researching and publishing. There's that publish and perish mentality that uh, still lives in existence in a, a number of places in different ways. The grants in particular can be very important in these set settings, and that's part of where the funding and scholarship options come from. Now, in the practitioner-based programs, it's different. Faculty often are expected to be involved in their field of study. So because it's practitioner-based, they're focusing on what they're teaching, that practice research assessment. And faculty in the research programs are focused a lot on what their uh, uh, professional interests are and what they're teaching, but from a research perspective and obtaining grant writing to fund the research. So faculty in both programs are involved in different ways, in ways that tend to reflect the training model. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to know your training model for, for many reasons. One, very simply, you're going to be asked on internship applications. And different sites prefer different training models. We'll talk about some research about this in a, in a minute. If you're in school, or either as a student or a professor, during an accreditation visit, you will often be asked about your, accreditation, about your um, training model. It also helps contextualize your program's approach to training. And you're looking at places you're applying for uh, practicums, internships, postdocs, uh, jobs. The training model will help you have a sense of understanding the program, its values, and its approach. As we, we talked about that uh, scientist practitioner, now we're going to go a little more in depth to the practitioner scholar to differentiate it here. This is a very succinct summary of it from an article by Peterson, Peterson, Abrams, and Stricter. This model 
develops practitioners who engage the challenge of the human condition directly, starting with the needs of each client and bring in the best available theoretical conceptions, the most useful available research, along with individual and collective professional experience to bear their, oops, there's a typo there, studying and improving the functional condition of the client. So this is very similar to evidence-based practice in a number of ways. When you think about the inclusion of the theoretical conceptions, the most useful available research, that implicitly has a broader perspective on it. Looking at the individual and professional experience is also important to consider. So there's a number of aspects to, to, to consider here. I apologize about the, the typo, but I believe this article is available open access online now. So you most likely can look up and find this to, to get the, the correct wording there on my, my little typo. But I think it still does get the, the general sense of what's being talked about here. Scholarship means drawing on established theory. So it's not just research theory. Research, especially local research. So it's not just um, the research that we often think of in psychology. It can be local research, looking at one's particular context. It can be research um, in a sense that's focused on how one works with one's own clients. So it's a, it's a broader conception of research. Looks at that individual and collective experience. That's part of the scholarship aspect of it. That includes professor, student, and client experience. And it's more interdisciplinary. So you can note here that it, the, the multiple forms of ways of knowing that are implicit here. It's more of a postmodern approach in that sense, and it bear, has some similarity to how evidence-based practice in psychology is talked about. Many of these things on this list here, you'd be, if you look at it closely, you'll see bears very close resemblance to what we've talked about in evidence-based practice. So the core values then are a broadening understanding of psychology with flexible epistemology and multiple ways of knowing. That's very postmodern, very evidence, uh, very similar to the early understandings of evidence-based practice. It's inclusive of integrative experiences, of broad ways of learning that include real examples and real experiences. So it draws from clinical examples from professors, clients, and students. It's often drawn upon in the classroom setting, in the training context, in the supervision context. The development of uh, it's the development of individual students as psychologists in a reflective atmosphere. So that reflectiveness is also important there. It's a competency-based curriculum. That is something that APA has moved towards more generally in its approach to accreditation. That also, again, is similar to the evidence-based practice. So we can see how this practitioner scholar model has had very significant influence on how training in psychology has developed over time, even for those that are in a scientist practitioner model. That's why we're going into this in a little bit more depth here. The training includes elements of practice, including the multiple roles, the, uh, the self of the professional psychologist, so that self-development, the reflective practice of becoming a, a psychologist, and systematic evaluation. Uh, it considers the social nature of psychology, including uh, the psychologist's role in the broader society. And over time, there's been more emphasis, particularly with consideration to diversity on that aspect. So why is some of this important? When we looked at this different research, and uh, looks like my uh, reference here is, is missing on this. I'll try to, um, if it's not later in the slides, add that as a note uh, to this video as after it's uploaded. The research examined, there's research that is examined internship match rates on training models grouped by three types of training models. Now this is lumping some training approaches into these three models. Science-based models, science practitioner-based models, and practice-based models. So we've talked more about the latter two, which are the two most popular. There's also this science-based models. Now when you look at the, the science-based models, they are more successful in getting placed at medical centers and VAs along with the science, scientist practitioner models. They're placed lower at community mental health centers and counseling centers. So if you're in this type of programs, you're gonna have better success rate at medical centers and VAs. Not as good of a success rate, most likely at community mental health centers and counseling programs. 
So if you're in undergrad and you're thinking about graduate school and where you're going to go, if you know where you want to practice eventually, that should uh, be a consideration, maybe not a, a complete determination, but should be a consideration in what school you want to go to. Does the training model fit with what is often used in preparing for different uh, professional um, careers over time, and including internships and postdocs? The scientist practitioner models um, still place pretty well at medical centers, second to the science models. Uh, placed well at VAs and hospitals, placed lower, again, at community mental health centers and counseling centers. The practice-based models placed higher at the community mental health centers, counseling centers, a lot of those are university-based counseling centers, and hospitals placed lower at VAs and medical centers. So again, um, if you're approaching internship, this gives you information about where you may be the most successful based on your training program. Though certainly there are people from the various training programs that get into all of these different settings at times. The training model often influences what's considered an appropriate dissertation. In science and scientific practitioner models, there's a higher focus on research. It needs to be a higher level of research and it needs to be original research. In practitioner models, there's more concern with the application and there's flexibility on the types. There are even some uh, practitioner models, CITE models, that will allow for a critical literature review. Not just a literature review, but a critical literature review as a program. That's, um, uh, some are critical of allowing for that to be a dissertation, even in practitioner programs, but it is done and it is accepted within AP accredited programs. There may not be as much focused about uh, original research, replication may be more appropriate in a lot of these practitioner models, and broader types of research may also be more appropriate. Um, within the science and scientist practitioner models, there often is a little bit more of a bias towards the quantitative research as well, whereas practitioner models, you're going to see more variations of uh, quantitative and qualitative. However, I think this is starting to change over time. There's some signs that it's changing. Um, particularly with the American Psychological Association Division 5, the changes there that are much more open to qualitative research. So APA is moving in a direction that uh, values both quantitative and qualitative research in a much more balanced manner. And there's work being done at the current time uh, that will, should be incorporated into the next APA style manual that is focused more on qualitative research as well. When you look at the APA style model, it does have an assumption for the most part of quantitative research in the um, way that the manual was designed. So the next approach is gonna be more inclusive of qualitative. So we're seeing this, this move of more emphasis on qualitative research, more value in qualitative research, and it being, um, encourage that more programs consider both quantitative and qualitative uh, of approaches, though these types of changes in the field tend to take a long time, so it still is, is early in that transition. And we'll have to see whether it continues to go in that direction. It always could change, too. Now, the model and APA accreditation is also something important to consider. Uh, APA requires that a training model be in place for programs. Um, but is open to various models in both PhD and PsyD programs. You don't have to, to choose a particular program even based on whether it's a PhD or PsyD um, program. Most programs will use established training models, but programs also can develop their own unique training model. When doing this, it's got to be clearly identified. It must be consistently adhered to. You must demonstrate how you're um, adhering to it, how you're measuring it, and it must be appropriate for the training of psychologists. You must be able to demonstrate that. This is a heavy burden. APA accreditation already is something that creates a lot of anxiety and consternation and angst for um, faculty, administrators, and, and often even students in going through that process of APA accreditation. And so it, it is perceived as being a much bigger risk to develop one's own unique training model. That's part of the reason, probably a big part of the reason why uh, it is more common to focus on models that are already established. 
as I've noted, there are a number of models. The two most common are the scientist practitioner and practitioner scholar. Some of the others are also the scholar practitioner. Now, that when you look at that in the literature, um, and unless it's changed in the last few years, it's been a few years since I've uh, done a more in-depth uh, review of articles on the practitioner scholar and scholar practitioner models, sometimes these are pretty synonymous. Sometimes there's some subtle differences in them. The difference between practitioner scholar and scholar practitioner is which comes first. Uh, scientist practitioner, the idea there is that one first is a scientist and that is one's basis to, for practice in a lot of ways. So that is the foundation there. The practitioner scholar is the, the emphasis first is on the practitioner and being able to draw from the scholarship. But one is being trained first to be a practitioner. Whereas in the scientist practitioner, one is being trained first to be a scientist, then a practitioner building from that. Scholar practitioner, one's developed first to be a scholar and then building from that a practitioner. So that ordering there, that's the way it's often interpreted, but not always. That's one of the challenges with these training models is that the terms are not always used consistently and they've all evolved over time. That part makes sense and I think is good. Any training model should evolve over time based on new information and our experiences with them. But um, the different usages can be confusing and problematic at times. Another model that, that was really growing in popularity for a while is the local clinical scientist model. This is really looking at um, making sure that uh, engaging in science and scholarship and research that's appropriate to one's own setting. So one should be engaged in research in one's own, one's own context. It, this is not necessarily the big randomized clinical trials, but it's uh, doing research maybe within one's practice on the, the outcomes. It may be looking more at what's happening and, and the uniqueness of one's own particular community. So there are um, some variations in there, but that is uh, another option. The bench scientist model, this is more uh, really focused on uh, being a, a scientist first, even more so than the scientist practitioner model. There's a practitioner model and developmental models that, um, the, again, these are not as popular. I don't know much about them because they've not been popular. I've not worked with them differently, but you can um, deduct some based on this conversation that the practitioner is likely to be much more develop, developed more specifically on practice than on the research or scholarship. As I have alluded to before and noted to some degree, AP8 evaluates how university schools and internship programs are doing based upon their training model. Thus, it's very important whether you're a student, faculty, or administrator in these programs. It's very important that you know your training model and what that means when these accreditation visits are coming up. As I've noted, it's useful in other settings too, but particularly in those contexts. There are schools that get in trouble because they are not consistent with their model. For some example, stating one is a practitioner scholar model but requiring students to do scientific practitioner type dissertations. That is problematic. Now, practitioner scholar models may have some dissertations that are very similar to the scientist practitioner model. But what would be expected within one of these programs is that there's a variation and there's a lot of people doing different types. If it's a requirement to do original research that's as intensive as the uh, scientist practitioner model, well, that's not being consistent with one's model. Similar being a scientist or practitioner model but not adequately focusing on research, well, that's problematic. So being consistent with one's training model is important. And there has been some discussion in the professional literature recently that many university and training programs are not following their espoused values and not functioning consistently with their training model. That puts them at risk um, for losing their accreditation or being put on probation. So again, it's important to know this stuff if you're in these contexts or settings. If you're out in practice, it may not be as uh, essential for you. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we can see how the training models have not only utility for the particular school, but they have important considerations 
for one's direction in one's career, for internships, uh, a variety of different things along these lines. Also, we can see how these different models have influenced the field over time. That as the, the society model, as the uh, practitioner scholar model has evolved, there have been changes in APA's approach to accreditation. And APA's approach to accreditation, whether a society or PhD model, now incorporates some of the influences of both the more traditionally PhD and the more traditionally society uh, affiliated models, which are the scientist practitioner and the practitioner scholar. So these have both had a significant influence on expectations for training in the field of psychology and training for, towards becoming a psychologist. They both have been influential in uh, understanding practice out in the field as well. When we look at uh, these, uh, how evidence-based practice and the outcome research has evolved over time, the empirically supported treatments fit much better with the scientist practitioner model. It makes sense that as we start to see a greater balance in the field and we can see more value in some of the other training models, that we move to different conceptions. So the early understanding of evidence-based practice really showed a lot of influence, as we've noted, from the, the NCSPP and the, the Vail model and the practitioner-scholar model. That is uh, the parallels between some of these standards of evidence-based practice in those models really are quite close. So that's uh, it for this lecture. Uh, if you don't know your training model, would encourage you to go ahead and look it up, uh, become familiar with it and what it means, and uh, take that into consideration as you continue to move forward both in your, your program and your career.